I was at a visitation, uh, visiting one of my church members' families. Um, and because there were many people at the home, um, I, I just lost track of time. But nonetheless, I'm here. And praise the Lord, the church member stays close to where I am. And, and, and when I was reminded, I was able to rush back home. Nonetheless, let us uh, go straight to, to our study for today. So our study for today is, is, is one to look at God's purpose in, in creating man. What, what does the Bible tell us um, God had in mind when he created uh, man? And we want to see, because it's, it's important for us to know why we are here. And, and, and once we understand why we are here, then it gives us a purpose to live for that is over and beyond ourselves. And that will not be hindered or be, that, that will not be destroyed by temporary circumstances that we may be going through. And, and also it might help us to understand maybe the plan of redemption in, 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 a, in, a, in a much more broader light than sometimes we think of it, all right? So in order for us to find that out, it's, it's, it's better to go to the beginning, right? Um, so we are going to start our study in the book of Genesis, in the book of Genesis. And last week we spoke about um, the, the, the war in heaven. And you will see that we have not left that, uh, that, that, that study. It's going to come in as we move. Uh, next week, we are going to talk about the fall of man. And we're going to see the connection between the fall of man and the original war that took place in heaven. All right? And we're going to build from there. Um, from there, we're going to look at the following week. We're going to look at the plan of salvation or the plan of redemption. All right? So... In Genesis, we are going to look at Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 26. Now we know that the Bible speaks about God creating um, different things uh, from day one. And I'm not going to go through that. I'm quite sure people have, have been through that in either Sabbath school or Sunday school. Or maybe we'll go through that in, in, in more detail some other day. But today I just want to focus on, on the creation of men. But nonetheless you will find out that man was actually more of a crowning act in God's creation. Look at verse 26. The Bible says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dom um, dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So God is now giving this or, or creating man. It, it's interesting that when the Bible speaks about man, it says here, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness so god when he created man when man cre came out of the creator's hand he bore the likeness in the image of god and after the bible speaks about men having dominion over basically the entire earth again the bible says so god created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the thing that the Bible, if you, if you notice, the Bible keeps on repeating this thing of image, the image of God, the image of God when, when in, 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 in reference to man. And you will notice that in none of the things that God created before he created man, he mentioned creating them in his image or created creating them in his likeness. It is only as he begins to talk about men that he speaks about creating in his image. So that is when God uh, actually emphasizes. And you will see that men is actually the climax of God's creation. Because 
when God created everything else, he said it was, it was good. And then the Bible says after he created man, um, verse 31, it says, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And in the evening and the morning were the sixth day. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. So, so the Bible tells us very clearly that God, when he looked at man and the rest of creation, of course, but especially after he created man, he says he looked at everything that he had made. As the Bible says, behold, it was very good. So when God created us, he said it was very good. Now, the Bible gives man a very important part in God's creation. It gives man a very key role in God's creation. Because here God creates everything that he makes. And then after creating man, number one, it says he creates man in his own image. And it keeps on repeating that. So man was to bear the image and the likeness of God, not only in outward resemblance, but especially in inward character, in how man was. All right. So this is very, very important for us to keep in mind as we are looking at men and we are looking at men's creation. It is very important for us to, 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 keep, that, to keep that in mind. Um, if you go with me to the book of Hebrews, I'm going to share something. And I hope it will not be too much of a shock to other people. Um, and I'm not trying to shock you, by the way. But sometimes, some things, some people, um, when they see them, their first reaction is, is that of shock. So I don't know how you're going to react to seeing this. Maybe you've seen it before. And if you have, praise the Lord. And if you haven't, um, then we're going to look at it together. Now, the Bible says, uh, speaking about um, about now the creation of man in Hebrews chapter two, um, verse five, the Bible says, for unto the angels, he has not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. So Paul says here in Hebrews, it, it, God has not entrusted the world to come to be under the dominion of angels. Then he says, but one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him? Now, of course, here he's quoting Psalm 8 verse 4 to 6 and it continues and says, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hand. So the Bible tells us that when God created man, he created him a little lower than the angels. So this is very, very important. Now, some of you may have a Bible with a margin, with a marginal reference. And if you do, and I just read from the King James, I don't know what Bible you are using at home. But if you would look in your margin, the margin is this part in the middle of your Bible. I don't know if you can see on your screen, but this part that has little verses that are, writ are, are written there. And um, sometimes it has also an alternative brand, uh, uh, reading. Yeah. All right? right. Now, if you look at this verse and you look at it in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in the original or in the Greek, or if you look at it in, in, in an alternative reading as you find it in the margin, it says a little while inferior to, meaning where it says a little lower in, 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 the, in the verses themselves. The other alternative rendering is actually uh, for a little while lower than the angels. All right. So this is something very important to consider. And what is the implication of this? If men were created for a little while longer, when I was leaving the house, I left with my daughter, who is uh, 
two years of age and I left my wife in the house. And I said to her, we'll, we'll be there for a little while and then we are going to come back. Now, when someone says uh, a little while, that, that means that they are not going to be there for long. They are going to be there for a specific amount of time and then come back. Now, I read it to, to you this verse in, in the King James so that you see that I'm not making things up. I'm going to read it now in the New American Standard Bible, the 1995 version of the New American Standard Bible. It says, you have made him a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, all right? So here it uses that alternative re rendering. Now I'm going to read the same Bible now, the 2020 version. It says, but someone has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you think of him or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You see this. Now I'm going to read for you in the ESV. Now this is the English standard version. Now it says the same thing. Uh, it has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that uh, you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. This is the ESV. Now there's something common between all these versions that I, I read to you because they are what you call, what is technically called um, by, by biblical scholars, um, formal equivalent translation, meaning that they translate as much as possible according to the form and as how it appears in the original. They don't try to reword it so that it makes sense. They don't try to do that. They try to give it as close as it, the English language can be to the original, which is the Greek language, all right? So all of them are actually giving the rendering that in the King James is actually in the margin to show that this is an authentic reading of the text. So what is the point that I'm trying to make here? From what Paul is saying here, man was not actually created by God to be forever lower than the angels. It was only for a little while. It was only for a specific period of time. And the con in the context, actually, we can see that because in verse five, it says, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. You don't see angels being given dominion over any part of God's creation. But when, man, when God created man, he gave the earth to man as a, 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 a trust for men to have dominion over. And Paul's argument here is that even the world to come, God has not given it the dominion over to angels. But we know, and we're running ahead of ourselves, and we're going to come back to this when we talk about the plan of redemption, that Jesus says to those who will be redeemed, he says, to those that overcome, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Now, it is kings that sit on thrones. Even as I have overcome and have sat with my father on his throne. Actually, the song that is sang, that, that is sung in, 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 um, in, in adoration of Jesus, the song of the lamb in, in, in Revelation chapter five, the, 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 the saints there are actually singing and praising God and saying, for he has redeemed us and made us kings and priests unto God. So when God redeems us, he makes us kings and priests and kings have dominion. And the Bible tells us that the meek shall inherit the earth and dwell therein forever. So the earth made new will be an inheritance of the saints. And like I said, I'm running ahead of myself in, 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 in saying this. So God was going to bring men back to his original plan of creating men to be for a little while lower than the angels. But remember, man was created to live forever. And therefore, in, from, 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 from his creation, man was to grow, man was to develop. And still, maybe he would have been in equality to angels. And maybe even higher than angels to a certain extent. Why? Because of this element that we don't read anywhere in the Bible. It talks about angels created in the image of God. But more than that, we don't hear anything that the Bible speaks about angels reigning with God. 
that is on, only spoken of, of men. All right, so now let's come back to the issue of being created. So I wanted to paint that picture for you in, 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 in your mind so that you understand the high, high uh, purpose that God had for men, that men should bear his image, that men should be only for a little while lo lower than the angels. It was not to be forever. That was not God's plan. Um, so we, we see this in, in, in creation. And, and this is what we are, we are to look, look, look at. Now, there's somewhere else in the book of Isaiah where God speaks about the purpose that he had when he created us. Look at um, Isaiah 43, verse 7. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Isaiah 43, verse 7. The Bible says, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. So the Bible tells us that all of God's people who are called by his name, God has formed us. He created us for his glory. That's what the Bible says. Now, glory is, 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 is spoken of in the Bible in the sense of God's presence and the light and that emanates from God. That's how the word glory is used in the Bible. But sometimes in the Bible, the word glory actually is used in the sense of speaking about God's attributes, God's character, his characteristics or the characteristics of, his, of, his, of, of, his, of who he is and his, and his character. We go with me to show this point in Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33, Moses in verse 18, Exodus chapter 33, Moses requests to see God's glory. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18. And he said, this is Moses speaking to the Lord. I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Excuse me. Um, my voice is not 100%. I've had a very busy weekend um, of preaching. I was even conducting a funeral this morning. So if my voice is not sounding well, please forgive me for that. All right. So. Here the Bible tells us that Moses asked to see God's glory. But now let's, ask, let's see how God responds to re this request by Moses. Verse uh, 19, the Bible says, And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And the Bible tells us very clearly that when, when Moses asked to see God's glory, the first thing that God spoke about is his goodness. He spoke about his name. He spoke about his grace. And he spoke about his mercy. So God actually spoke about his character rather than revealing his splendor. By the way, if he had revealed his splendor to Moses, Moses would not have been able to live because Later on, he says that I cannot show you my face. I can only show you my backward part. But the focus of the text is more on God's character rather than his physical um, attributes. Look at chapter 34. Now when God begins to pass by before Moses, and the Bible says in verse 5, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. So now the Bible tells us very clearly here that God, when he came down, he actually proclaimed his character. That's basically what he did. When he talks about him proclaiming his name, he says, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, 
abounding in goodness and truth. And you will notice this, by the way, about God and his name even, that when, 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 when a people had an encounter and a certain experience with God, they would name even the places that they had that experience with God, the Lord is there. You know, the Lord will provide, for example, um, El, uh, uh, El Shaddai. So, 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 so all of these, uh, I mean, sorry, um, is it? now I'm, I'm, I'm getting confused, Jehovah Jireh, sorry. The Bible tells us very clearly though, that these characteristics of God are actually re representing his glory. I lost my train of thought a little bit. So, so, so they, 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 they actually represent his glory. So when Moses asked for God's glory, God reveals to him his character. So when God says, I've created you for my glory, basically God is saying, I have, ref I have created you to reflect my character, to show forth my character to the world. Now, again, even in the New Testament, this use of glory is seen in John chapter one. Remember in John chapter one, verse one to three, the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Now in verse 14, the Bible says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld him, the glorious of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So the Bible tells us very clearly that when we beheld Jesus, we saw the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So what was the glory of the only begotten of the father seen through Jesus Christ? It was grace that God is full of grace and God is full of truth. And you're going to see as you are reading, especially the gospel of John, you can see this in all the gospel, by the way, that Jesus, his life and his death on the cross also, among other things, was correcting people's misconception of the character of God. I'll just give you an example with one thing. The Pharisees had laws as pertaining to the Sabbath, all right? The Sabbath was given by God. The Sabbath was made by God for men, right? Meaning for men's benefit. Because God knows what is best for men because he created men. So, Jesus says the Sabbath was made for men. Now, on top of the call or the command of the Sabbath, not, uh, not of God, not to work on the Sabbath, they started loading down the Sabbath with other rules that they made up. And, and, and some of them included how much of a distance you could travel on Sabbath before you transgress the Sabbath, if you travel more of that distance, you know. Um, some things like if you turn on your lights on Sabbath, it's the same as kindling a fire on Sabbath. And therefore, in Exodus, we are told not to kindle a fire on Sabbath. So they would not put on their lights, their lamps on Sabbath. Someone would actually put on the lamp um, before the Sabbath comes. But if, it, if they do that, then the, the lamp has to go until it goes off by itself. They can turn it off or else they will be working on Sabbath. All right. By the way, some Jews even have these practices today um, in rabbinical Ju Judaism. That's why some will even use their Gentile neighbors to actually turn on the lights for them. Now, one of these laws was that you could not even administer healing on Sabbath. That's why they persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him sometimes because he had healed people on the Sabbath. And Jesus asked them a question one time when they were questioning his disciples plucking grain on Sabbath. And he asked them, Okay, who of you would actually allow or let his animal stay in a ditch? If it has fallen in a ditch on Sabbath, will not take it out of that ditch. Now, Jesus was not making something up when he said that. If you look at the Mishnah, which is basically rabbinical laws from around the time 200 BC to around the time 400 AD, all right? Among the rules that the Pharisees had, which was the strictest uh, sect in Judaism, of course, except for the Qumran people, there were some people who lived in caves near the Dead Sea. Those ones were more strict. But with these people, with the, with the Pharisees and with the rabbis, they would allow a person that if your animal falls on a ditch on the Sabbath, you could actually take it out. 
But now, Jesus will allow you to take out your animal on Sabbath will say you cannot heal a person on Sabbath. So what have they actually sought to do? What they have uh, not sought to do, but what they've done willingly or unwittingly is that they have made animals more important than men. It's more important to rescue your animal that has fallen on a ditch than to cure someone from a dreadful disease on a Sabbath. And now if God is the one who gave the Sabbath commandment, what does that say about God? That means God is a God who cares more for animals than he does for human beings. So when Jesus was doing the things that he did specifically on the Sabbath, he was doing it deliberately because he was trying to correct people's views of who God is. Now, when God created men, let's go back because we were talking about Jesus um, uh, uh, when we saw Jesus, we saw the, the glory of the only begotten of, of the Father, full of grace and truth. So when we saw Jesus, we saw the character of the Father. He revealed the character of God. Now that is why at the end of Jesus' mission, Jesus says, I have glorified your name on the earth. Now glorify me with the glory that we had since the foundation of the world. Now Jesus was not saying, I want light to proceed forth from me so that people can see this glorious light. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. But Jesus was going to be glorified by the Father one more time when God would reveal his love for men through the death of Jesus on the cross. So that was the glory that Jesus was speaking about. So man was actually created when we came forth from God's hand. It was God's purpose that we would show forth his glory, that we would show forth his character, that we would show forth his attributes. Before I go into this issue, if you can remember, we said last week that the Bible clearly tells us that Lucifer was perfect in all his ways from the day that he was created. So when he came out of the creator's hand, he was perfect in all his ways, in his thoughts, in his feelings, in his meditations, in his deeds, he was perfect. Now the Bible doesn't tell us until when in terms of time, but it tells us until when in terms of event or circumstance, until iniquity or lawlessness was found in him. Now, in order for you to do something that can be labeled as lawlessness, you have to have a law to be lawless against. And the Bible says that his beauty has filled, has corrupted his wisdom, and it has filled his mind, his heart with violence, and he has sinned. And we read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, that the Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. Once again, we see that there is a connection between the deeds of Lucifer in heaven and the transgression of God's law. And we spoke briefly about the fact that the law of God is actually a transcript of his character. If you want to know the character of God, look at his law. And it's interesting that when Jesus was asked the summary of the law, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. When he was asked for the, great, the greatest of the commandments, then this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So the basic principle in, in, in the law of God is love. And we learned last week that even the apostle Paul says, love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So you see these things come all together. Because if we have time and we're going to do this when we're looking in detail at the law of God, you will notice that the, the attributes that are said about God are said a lot about the law as well. The Bible says God is good. The Bible says the law is good. The Bible says God is just. The Bible says the law is just. The Bible says God is everlasting. The Bible says the law is everlasting. The Bible says that God is perfect. The, 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 the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So you see that the attributes that are, are, are given to God are also given to his law. 
And therefore, the law itself is a reflection of God's character. So when man came out of the creator's hand, he reflected the character of God. He was obedient to God's ways. Because obedience to God's law is but a reflection of his character. And it is showing an attitude of submission to God's ways and a desire to reflect the character of God. Not in a legalistic way, but both in letter and in spirit. What do I mean in letter and in spirit? The Bible says, for example, you shall not kill. Jesus speaks about this. Therefore, that means that we should not literally take a knife and stab someone and kill them. That's true. Should not take a gun, shoot someone and kill them. That's true. But in this deeper spiritual sense, it actually means not to be angry at your brother without a cause. It actually means not to speak abusive words to your brother like you fool. Raka, as Jesus speaks. And as John says, it is not just not to murder or hate your brother, but it is to love your brother. And the Bible says that he that does not love his brother is a murderer. And we know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So this is the spirit of the law. So you see that in its depth, the law is not just dealing with outward actions, but it is talking about the inward heart, who you are at the heart. That's why the Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That's why the Bible speaks about the fact that the law of God and the word of God cuts to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit. And it is the discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So man was created to reflect this glory, to reflect this image, to reflect this character of God. And if Lucifer indeed warred against the law of God in heaven, then that means that he questioned the character of God. If the law of God is is a transcript of his character, therefore when Lucifer rebelled against the law of God, which we know according to Revelation 12 verse 17, he has a problem with those who keep the commandments of God. If Lucifer indeed had a problem with the law of God, that means that the, the war in heaven was a challenge against the character of God. And therefore, in the scheme of this cosmic war that we looked at last night, I mean last week, man was created to argue God's side of the controversy. Because it might seem to us like a simple thing, but it's not. How do I know that it was not? The Bible says this dragon in chapter 12 drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Now, later on, the same chapter says that uh, the dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And the question is, so, so we get the answer of who these stars that he drew with his tail. Now, what is the tail? In Isaiah 9, verse 15, the Bible says, the ancient and the honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. And the Bible speaks about the fact that he was trading, Lucifer was trading in heaven. Read this in Ezekiel chapter 7. He says, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled their heart, thy heart with violence and our sin. So what was Satan merchandising? It's interesting that in, 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 in 2 Peter chapter 2, when he speaks about false prophets, it says, and through feigned words, meaning pretentious words, they shall make merchandise of you. So the same trick that was used by the devil, deception, pretentious words, what the modus operandi of the devil in heaven. That's why Jesus says that Satan was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. Why? Because when you go against the law of love, the Bible says, if you do not love your brother, you are a murderer. 
And also, Lucifer used merchandising in heaven, meaning he used deception. He used the same tricks that false prophets use, that is deception. That's why he talks about a tail that drew the third part of the stars of heaven in Revelation chapter 12. All right? So Satan used, and the deception was so powerful that a third of the angels in heaven, a third, think about that, think about that. All of us are tempted every day. And there's about eight, almost eight billion of us on the earth. And there's no one who goes a day without being tempted. And the devil is not God. He is not omnipresent. And therefore, there are demons that are tempting people every day. And they are tempting all of us. And if we are 8 billion, that tells me that on this earth are roaming more than 8 billion demons. <laughs> that is why if you go and you leave your house without prayer, you are in serious trouble. If you leave your house without the protection of God and without the protection of heavenly angels that can camp around about those that love God and protect them. If you leave your house without assurance that you have that entourage from heaven, you are in serious trouble. I am in serious trouble. That is why it is unsafe to go even an hour without prayer. I'm not talking about just leaning in prayer but even having a prayerful attitude in your heart. All right? So now, if this deception was so much in heaven, do you think it's possible that even the angels that were left in heaven, theoretically speaking, might have been affected in some way? They did not rebel, yes. They did not leave God, yes. They did not side with Lucifer in the controversy, yes. I'm not saying that, but don't you think maybe certain questions may have been raised in their minds? And maybe a seed of doubt as to God's character may have been planted. I'm saying may. And we're going to develop this thought. So, what is the point? God's character has been challenged. Yes, Lucifer has been cast out of heaven. But that is not the end of the war. Was the end of the war would have to be the destruction of the devil. But he's not destroyed. He's cast out of heaven. And then God creates men. And places them upon the earth. And men are to reveal the attributes of God and the character of God. So men, I can imagine that it is possible that men were to be angels case study to fully understand the character of God that was actually challenged by Lucifer in heaven. And quite possibly that this case study was to answer some of the charges that Satan made against the character of God. So the information that we are clear about is that Satan had a, a problem with the character of God. Why? Because he rebelled against the law that is the transcript of his character. And therefore, when you rebel against the law, then you are rebelling against the author. And then you are imputing. a certain, or you are suggesting a deficiency in the one who gave the law. And Satan was successful enough to have a third of angels that were created holy, that had been praising God in heaven, that had lived in a perfect environment, and they were willing to side with him in the controversy. And then God says, okay, I'm going to show who I am and I'm going to create man. And man is going to stand as my representative to reveal to the angels who I am amongst other things. Now it's interesting that out of God's creation, 
in terms of intelligent beings. Humans can procreate. That's why part of God's creation of man, he says, he blessed them and he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Why? Because in procreation, they were to imitate God. God created men to have dominion over the whole earth, over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. But the dominion of men over the earth was not a domineering over the lower orders of beings like animals and insects and all of these other things. But it was more of a dominion of stewardship and taking care of them. That's why we read um, in, 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 in chapter two, where the Bible says, and the Lord God took the man in verse 15 and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So he was to work the garden, to beautify the garden and to keep it well. So man had this stewardship over the garden. The same way that God has ultimate ownership and rulership over his entire creation. So man was to do in miniature form what God does in the grander scale. So what God was in the universe man was to imitate on the earth. All right, I would go into, in, into other things. So as, as, as angels would watch men procreating, and then it, that, would, that would be, of course, an imitation of God's creation. And if man was reflecting God's image, the way that man would treat his offspring would be a reflection to the angels of how God deals with his created beings. As men would set order and rules and regulations and ways for their children to live and behave, angels would understand why God has principles and a law by which they are to abide and all of these things. And angels would have a better understanding of God by watching those who have been created in the image of God. Now, um, as a parting shot, the Bible doesn't tell us that God's plan has changed for men. And uh, if God has called those that he has created to be reflective of his glory. That means that God is still calling us today to be merciful. <laughs> That's why in Luke, the Bible says, be therefore merciful as your father, which is heaven, in heaven is merciful. That is why the Bible says, um, when the unjust servant is choking, his fellow servant says, should you not have done to your fellow servant as I've done to you? If I showed mercy to you, why not show the same mercy? If God is full of grace, grace, the graciousness of God should be seen in his people. If God is a forgiving God, maybe that's why the Bible says, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. If God is full of goodness, and truth, the Bible speaks about those who will make it and who will stand on Mount Zion. It says they swear to their own hurt and they do not change, meaning they stand by their word no matter what. They are people of truth. The goodness of God is seen through us. So God is still calling us to reflect this character. Of course, the story doesn't end here, but we are going to end it here today to say God had a purpose. Of course, we, are different, we have different personalities and we are to reflect the image of, and the character of God through our different personalities. But we are called to only have, the, only have one character and that is the character of God. And may God help us that by his grace, we may live up to this calling. Thank you. Yo, that was powerful. 
you know, I'm sitting down here and doing some introspection. And I'm saying, as you are saying and telling us this tonight, and God is talking through you, obviously, that we are supposed to be, you know, exhibiting the character of God. And that was the purpose we were created. And I'm looking at myself and I'm taking it personal. And I say, which character of God am I exhibiting? When someone looks at me out there, what character, what, what is God's character that they see from me? And um, I think that is a very, very personal question. And uh, I think I will start doing some introspection as I live, as I walk, that what, what are people seeing through me? Do they, which character of God are they seeing? Friends, we are taking about questions now. We are taking questions about 15 minutes or so. Uh, I think we will close it at around quarter past. If we have questions, I will open it up to all of us. Very interesting lesson. And Fundis, once, once again, you have simplified creation. We created to exhibit God's character. I like the point that you were saying that, you know, when, when angels look at us, <laughs> when angels look, look at us, they might see God in us. That's how powerful we are. That's how powerful we are. Friends, uh, without any waste of time, is there anyone who has a question, a comment? Um, we, we are allowed to do that. It's a lesson study. It is not a sermon. Is there anyone you can write on the chat? If you have a comment, if you have a question, it's a very interesting lesson. Um, we can open it up. Just raise your hand. Just raise your virtual hand. We will notice that. Uh, we only have about 14 minutes or so. I'm, I'm opening it up right away right away and 